women, listen up. You're gonna wanna hear this. And hey guys, don't you check out just yet. You might have a woman in your life that needs to know that November 6th and 7th is Breakaway Women's Conference. And if there was ever a year that you needed Breakaway, it's this year. Simply put, Breakaway is a chance for you to recharge. You're gonna experience amazing worship both your favorite local speakers and two national guest speakers. And of course, all of our favorite part, breakouts and workshops, where you have a chance to connect around topics that are geared just to what you are going through in this stage of life. Breakaway is coming simulcast to you in three ways this year. The first one is at a host home. You and some friends can gather together to stream Breakaway together at home. Two, you can participate on your own. You can experience Breakaway online for every week. Or three, simulcast locations. This is a chance for larger groups to gather together safely to have live hosts and the simulcast experience together. And the best part is that tickets are only $29. Yes, that's right, only $29. And you have the opportunity to add on a breakaway bonus box to your registration that's gonna be filled with all of the favorite things that you've come to love about Breakaway, a mug, a journal, a pen, and so many amazing surprises, especially from some of our great sponsors. Here's a little bit of what you can look forward to for Breakaway this year. See, because who Jesus was, as recorded in these, this book, is who Jesus is and who God will forever be, which gives us courage to discover who he is. So I can tell you with 100% certainty, he's moving towards you. Which direction are you going? The time is now for us to unwrap our God-given gifts, for us to step in and reclaim our inheritance and run, not like people who've been enslaved, but by free women running into all God has for us and inviting everybody to discover the God who sets you free from fear, who sets you free from sin, who sets you free from comparison, who sets you free from it all and gives you a new beginning. That's why we're here. That is why we're here. Hi, New Life. Hi, I'm Richard. And I'm Jenny, and we're glad to be here with you today. Yeah, we, we hope that you take this time to connect with Jesus and to connect with other New Lifers. In fact, there's a link to a connection card that you can fill out with prayer requests or just to say, hi, I was here. And don't forget, at the end, there's a special moment just for kids, so make sure they're around for that. Yeah, so today there's going to be inspiring music, an encouraging message, and our hope is that you leave this time more encouraged than when you walked in. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Better than you. Oh, 
and thank you for watching online today. Um, I was thinking about you. I was at Panera Bread, and I was getting some treats and some coffee, and I went to pay for it, and before I could pay for it, there was something 
where the person that was helping me said, do you know your um, loyalty number? And I was like, oh, okay, because you can get points for this. And I, I always want points. And so I typed in my phone number, and um, there was a moment where when I typed in, I, I hit enter, and then on the screen it said processing loyalty. And I was, you know, here's what I was thinking about. I was thinking that, like, is this a time in COVID where we're getting to see people's faithfulness and loyalty in ways that are special? And I, I thought about you. I thought about your giving to the mission in a time of COVID. Many of you have been just faithfully giving. And I needed you to have a moment because I was thinking about you. And I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for continuing to worship God with your giving. Thank you for continuing to fund the mission of God in our communities and the spreading of the message of the gospel. That's the gospel is the only thing that's gonna transform our nation and our cities because it's the, it, the gospel is the only thing in this world that has the power to transform the human heart. So thank you for your faithful giving. And if you have not jumped onto the giving team or you're new to all of this, you're just watching this, would you right now, would you today, would you click over and make a gift to the mission um, and faithfully decide that on a reoccurring way that you would be a part of this great team that God is building to spread the great message of God's love. And so I've just been processing my own loyalty and grateful for yours. So a couple things I'm excited about this fall I need you to know about. One is the Breakaway Conference. One of the biggest events that we do all year is a women's conference called Breakaway. And this year we have, I think, two of the top speakers in the nation and they're going to be speaking to our church, to you, to your families. This is, this is the way to do it. If you've got a daughter that you want to have a spiritual moment with, or a mom you want to reach out to, or a friend that you're like, I want to share my love for God, or they need to be encouraged. Do you know anyone that could use some encouragement? Maybe you. If you're listening to this and you're a guy, who's a, who's a woman that you love, you care about, and you just would send this over to him as a way of saying, hey, our church is doing breakaway. You're going to love it. And so um, this is an opportunity in your workplaces to really to encourage hearts, to spread faith, and to, to really to build our hope in God. I am so grateful for all the amazing women of God that we have in our church, and I'm so excited for Breakaway this year. The other thing I'm really excited about coming up is, you're gonna hear about it next week, but they're called uh, Discipleship Cohorts. And we've never done this before. So this would be an opportunity with like, think of like, like four or five of your closest friends Maybe it is literally your family. And what if you studied the Gospels this fall with a guide that's been trained to kind of walk alongside you and help you integrate this into your life? The number one need in American churches today is discipleship, and it's the number one thing that Christians want. Yes, we want to spread the Gospel to everybody, but how is the Gospel transforming my life now that I've been following Jesus for a little while? And so you're gonna hear about this starting next week. We'll have signups for it, but I want you to start to get ready for it. And if you're like, like my wife, she has her three or four closest friends. And I just envision the five of them all going through this discipleship cohort together. So be looking for that. And the last thing is this is next weekend, I have a message that I wanna share with you. I'm actually calling it a message from the heart. I feel like God has given me something very specific for our church and for all of you who've been really participating online or in person as much as you can, or maybe you're just somewhere in the world and you feel connected to this church because you've been connecting to this message. Next weekend, I wanna share with you what God put on my heart and then call us to action together. I know this, disconnection is the number one hindrance to spiritual growth, but what holds us together is stronger than what's trying to tear us apart. I can't wait to share the message with you. That's next week. This week though, we're wrapping up the series on sin and glory. Look at our problems in the world today. I mean, there's so many of them. They seem to be multiplying and complex and unsolvable, but what's beneath all of them? And what if what's beneath them is something that nobody's talking about? Like, I'm not talking about it, you're not talking about it. We just don't, and it's our world's biggest problem. And it's sin. Now, when we think about sin, is it just like the worst thing I've ever done or the worst thing that anyone's ever done to me? And if maybe if everyone thought like me, talked like me, saw the world the way that I did, then our world would be a better place. But what if that's even part of the power of sin? It's about me. The Bible defines sin as missing the mark, both in the Hebrew and Greek mindset. It's an archery term. So I want to ask you, what's the mark? What are you missing? And what if the mark is God's glory? 
So I ask you, what are you aiming your life at? Because when we talk about sin, we have to talk about glory. And when we talk about glory, we have to talk about God. And God doesn't want any of us to miss out on what life is really about. Hey, so how are you doing? No, really, how are you doing? It's interesting. People have been asking me that since we've been in the middle of a pandemic, dealing with the tension of racial tension, dealing with fire that's happening right now. They asked me how you're doing, and you know what's interesting? Before this year, I always answered that really easy. I'm doing great. Now I found out it's actually harder to say I'm doing great this year. Have you found that to be true in your life? I think it's that way because there's so much tension. Right now it seems like everywhere you go there is tension in the world. And what's interesting is when New Life was launched, we said this statement that we thought was so cool, so good. There's power in the tension. Doesn't that sound good? Not if you're in the tension. But there's something important to that. I want to look at that because I believe this. This year is one of our greatest potentials of growth as an individual, as a church, in our community, in our family. But I think it's also a potential for crisis and pain. And this whole year, I've seen people that have just been spinning out because of tension. Now, growing up, I grew up um, and uh, I went water skiing all the time. And with water skiing, there's something you don't want, which is slack. Because in order to water ski, you have to actually have the tension of the boat pulling you up. How many here, have you ever tried to water ski and do that, right? You know, when you teach someone to water ski, it can go really wrong really quick. They'll yell the famous words, hit it or go. And the boat driver will hit the gas and the person will hold on with their little two skis. They're shaking and they try and go and then something happens. They get pulled over their skis and they go under the water. And there's usually this moment when they're under the water where you literally can almost see their eyes being peeled back from the water and they feel like they're getting drugged and they come up, they, they're spitting, they're coughing. It's, it's, it's a bad experience. I think sometimes that's what tension feels like. Do you feel like you're being drugged behind a boat? Now, the other moment is a moment of victory when they hit the gas and they don't fight the rope. They go with the tension and they pop up, they stand and everybody in the boat cheers and there's this moment of excitement and then maybe they pull and then they fall again. It's the journey. We have tension. And I just wonder if today maybe you're here and you feel like you're fighting the boat Maybe you're here and you feel like, man, I'm being drugged behind the boat. Or maybe you've actually been in the middle of this tension and you're starting to feel like I'm actually growing and thriving because of it. I want to talk to you today about how you can thrive in the middle of tension. In fact, we're ending this series on the book of Romans, and we're going to be in the last part of Romans. It's Romans 14 through 16. And we've been talking throughout this series about sin and glory. Now, if you've ever gone to a church and studied the book of Romans, or maybe you've never even heard of the book of Romans, you'll know this. It tends to be the first four chapters everybody gets excited about. Because Paul talks about the fact that God has this opportunity for you to experience his glory by faith in Jesus Christ. It's powerful. It's the first four chapters. The next four chapters, they, they, they are all about the depth and height of love. They're, they're all about what Christ has done for you to transform you, to make you holy, to make you new. It starts to slow down, though, after that, because then he spends about four chapters talking about Judaism versus Gentiles, and most people are going, what? And then there's the last four chapters. If you make it to the last four chapters, they might be some of the most important chapters in the entire book because it's talking about how you live in Christian community. I'd like to say it this way. Paul thinks this, that if you're a part of a church, your job here is to make it look like heaven. And it seems like everywhere I go, it doesn't look like heaven. But there's something that happens when not just you are transformed and experience God's glory. There's something that happens when you're surrounded by a group of people that are all experiencing the glory of Jesus Christ. Have you been missing your friends? I know I have. Like, I have been missing my friends. And last weekend, I had the most awesome opportunity to spend um, uh, three days with some great friends. Every one of them are followers of Jesus. And every one of them build me up, strengthen me, 
encourage me. And I just wonder, are there a group of people in your life that are building you up? Who's the person you call when you feel down? Part of being a part of a community of God means this, that you've got that team, that group. And maybe you're here today and you feel a little disconnected or you're listening online and you're just going, man, I can't believe I'm listening online. I used to go to church and now I'm watching church. I think we've all felt that tension. And what can happen is this, is that tension can lead to fighting. It can lead to defensiveness. Paul's church had a ton of tension that led to a ton of disagreement. And catch this, if you are a part of any community anywhere, maybe it's a family, maybe it's a marriage, maybe it's a church, sooner or later, you're going to disagree. I want to encourage you, you're normal. If you fought with someone in the church, if you've disagreed with a leader, if you've had an argument with your spouse, guess what? You're normal. We all disagree. And I used to think this, if I disagree with someone, then I have to divide. And that's just not at all true. If you're human, you're going to disagree. In fact, when you learn to disagree respectfully, what happens is this. It doesn't dishonor someone when you disagree with them. And you begin to learn how to deal with the tension. So Paul had all of this tension in this church, and they were fighting. In fact, have you noticed this? Churches fight. In fact, this week, I found the five silliest things churches have actually split over. Okay? Do you want to see how people fight? They fight about silly things. Okay, let me give you five things churches split over. Okay, the first one is this. One church split over the appropriate length of a worship pastor's beard. Now, I don't know. Is it a goatee? Is it long? Do you, I mean, I don't know, but they, they split over that. The second one is uh, they split over uh, whether the church should build a children's playground over a cemetery. That's crazy. The third one is this. A church actually had a vote about switching their crackers to gluten-free, which my wife would be totally for because she's gluten-free, on communion, and they split over it. The fourth one is this, is there was a worship leader that wouldn't wear shoes, and the church split over it. And the fifth one, and my final one, and I might have got caught up on this one, I'm just saying I might have, is a church split over a vote to move from serving Folgers coffee to Starbucks coffee. Now, aren't those silly? But have you noticed in your life that you've been fighting over things that you just used to never fight over? I have. I found myself more irritable, a little more judgy. And today I want us to look at how in the middle of this struggle, in the middle of this tension, Jesus can work in our hearts. So I wrote down three questions. And if you're following along, I encourage you, write these down. These three questions are guiding how I'm thinking about this message. The first one is this, is how do I bring heaven here? What does it look like as a follower of Jesus to actually bring the love of Jesus Christ to every community you're in, whether it's work, whether it's home, family, church? The second one is this. How do I see and celebrate the glory of Jesus in everyone around me? How do I make sure that I'm actually seeing what Christ is doing in someone's life? And the third one is this, is how do I become someone who unifies my home, my church, and my community. Now, as you look at those three questions, I wonder if you'd circle, which one do you think is the one that like, that's the one that you're going, I need to lean in on that one. Okay, so let's jump in to Romans chapter 14. We're gonna walk through and look at it, okay? So here's the things that Paul's church was fighting over. It says this, it says Romans 14, it says, except the ones whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters, One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another's whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Okay, so Paul, what were they fighting about? The first one is this. They're fighting about food. Can you believe a church that would argue over food? In fact, they were arguing over the fact that some people thought they should only be vegetarians. All the vegetarians are like, amen, yes, right. Paul talks about, and I circled this word, disputable matters. Uh, in the, in the, I'll be going back and forth between the NIV and the um, New Living Translation. And the reason why I'm looking at both of them is because it's, it's interesting to see how they talk about it. In the New Living Translation, they say, they fight over what's right or wrong. Have you noticed that tension in our culture right now? I'm right. I'm wrong. These are disputable matters. Paul's actually saying, as he walks through this verse, 
that we actually need to lay down these right and wrong moments, these disputable matters, and see the glory in the person we're arguing with. For me, I know this. When I stop listening, I start to get defensive. When I start, when someone's talking and I've already made up my mind about what they're gonna say, what happens is this, my tension grows, my anxiety grows, and then what happens is this, is I just start thinking about my argument, not about what I don't know. When it comes to disputable matters, one of the questions I like to ask is this, what don't I know? In other words, when someone's talking to me and they have an opinion and I disagree with it, the first thing I wanna think is, what don't I know? What are they gonna teach me? The heart of it is to be curious. Let's look at the second thing. The second thing is they fought over sacred days. It says, one person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. So people have different things that are, I would call their convictions, the things that are important to them. When someone shares a conviction with you, the way to get in a great fight is to shoot it down. What Paul is saying is this, listen, learn. If someone considers it a sacred day, then celebrate with them. In fact, it says that God will celebrate with them on that sacred day. The third verse says this. It says, you then, why do you judge your brothers and sisters? Or why do you treat them with contempt? This third one is judgmental people. I think everywhere you're going to go, you're going to run into someone that's just a little grumpy, just a little bit irritable. I found myself in those same shoes a few times this year. And what happens is this, is you begin to judge and you begin to treat someone with contempt. Contempt means this, that I no longer care about their good. I no longer care about their good. And what happens is this, at the root of contempt is I've stopped loving. And I just wonder, are there some people in your life that God is saying, learn how to love them? You say, but Brandon, you don't know what they've done or what they've gone through. Jesus Christ says, go to loving your enemy. Now listen, if they've hurt you, it might not mean reconcile. But what it might mean is this, I am not going to look at them with eyes of contempt. I'm not going to judge their actions. My job is to love my neighbor, even if it's my enemy. And so Paul sets this up, and he's saying, okay, so we're dealing with people that are arguing about food, they're arguing about sacred days, they're arguing about judgmental people. I look at that, and I think, those are all silly arguments. And I just wonder, are there some silly arguments that we're dealing with right now that maybe are very important convictions to you, but they're getting in the way of the unity of the church? And what happens is that tension is actually polarizing instead of propelling us to grow. How do we stop it? How do we change it? Paul says this, he says, therefore, let, let us stop passing judgment on one another. And then he said this word, instead, I circled that word. It says, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of your brother or sister. He says, I want you to stop. He uses this word. In fact, he uses this legal term when he uses the word instead there. The word in Greek is just these two letters, un. That's all it is. And he uses it 48 times in this book. And basically what it is, it's an antecedent saying that everything before is not who we're going to be. And I just wonder, is there a moment in your life where you need to say, okay, I've been going down this path, I've been living this way, and it's actually creating division. It's creating division in my home, in my church, in my life. And Christ is saying to you, un. Instead, make up your mind not to be a stumbling block. What does it look like? I'm going to give you three things that I think will help you stop the fighting. The first one you can write down is this, is make up your mind. It comes right out of that verse. This idea of make up your mind, it's, it's this concept of, of building. It's, it's a concept of making decisions. Okay, I, I think of it like this. Okay, So uh, when you look at that word, un, it, it's like a basketball turn to pivot. Anybody play basketball? Now you'd think, because I'm a tall guy, I'm 6'4", you'd go, he's probably a basketball player. Not really. Like I played basketball in eighth grade and in ninth grade. When I made it to ninth grade, I was playing on an AAU team. That's the level I got. That was the highest level I got in basketball. 
And I was halfway through the game. We're a little bit behind. I was the sixth man. They weren't putting me in. I was yelling to the coach, put me in. I can make a difference. I can make a change. Finally, the coach puts me into the game. I catch the ball. I stop and I pivot 180 degrees. And I run and I start dribbling and I could hear the coach yelling and I could hear the crowd cheering as I shot the basket and I made my first basket in the wrong team's bucket. It was the other team. I scored a point for the other team. And I just wonder if right now we find ourselves in situations where we need to make up our mind that we're not gonna score points for the other team. Maybe even it's been fighting with someone. And you're just fighting about the wrong stuff. Paul might say to you, make up your mind. Un, pivot 180 degrees. The second thing he talks about is to build up, to build each other up. In fact, the verse is this. It's verse 19, chapter 14. It says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Mutual edification. That word edification, it literally means to build up, to make strong, and to bless your life. If you're to ask me, what does it mean to make it look like heaven? Everyone around you, make it your goal to build them up, to make them strong, and to bless their life. How do we make sure with our words, we're building people up, we're making them strong? Okay, I think about it this. There's two words that I think that when I lean on these words, it goes the wrong direction, okay? Feeling and action. Now listen, it is good to feel, right? When you feel love, it is awesome. When you feel happiness, awesome. When you feel anger or bitterness, those hurt. Those are hard. Feelings are real. They're valid. You need to have feelings. We need to have feelings, but here's the thing. It is dangerous to act on feelings. When you feel and act, here's what it leads to. It leads towards stinking thinking. That's right, I said it, stinking thinking. It leads towards it. I want you to remember that this week. There's a third thing that you've got to put in a third word. You have to move from just feel and act to feel, think, and act. Adding in that word think is critical. What I'm about to say when you're talking to someone, I've actually thought about it. Here's what thinking does. It actually adds leadership to your feelings. I don't know about you, but this year, more than ever, I have needed to lead my feelings. I needed to lead my feelings to make sure that my words, my actions, my character are building people up. Here's what I've noticed. When I focus on building others up, I start to build myself up with my thinking. And what I've noticed is this. When someone's tearing someone down, it's because internally they've been tearing themselves down. That's where it comes from. It's from the root. The third thing I want to look at is how we build each other up. And and, and as we walk through this, actually, before we get to the third thing, it says this, we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please himself, as the scripture says, the insults of those who insult you, oh God, have fallen on me. If we're going to be someone who builds people up, you can write this down. Insults need to stop with Jesus. In other words, I've noticed this. When I start thinking about insults, those insults are usually because I've been insulted and I want to insult back. And it becomes a cycle that goes back and forth between you and someone else. And what Paul says is those insults belong at the cross. That you actually put them there, that you nail them to the cross. And it means this, I determine in my mind, I make up my mind to build each other's up. I'm not going to bring an insult into that relationship, into that community, into that workplace, in that area. The second verse as he goes up through 15 is he says, may God who gives this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ. So it says this, that actually when we pray, we can pray, God, give me patience and encouragement so that I can lead towards harmony. That's the goal. Is like, how do I have harmony with the people that are around me? I think of it in like, have you ever watched an orchestra? 
When an orchestra plays, and listen, I don't play music, I don't, but I appreciate it. I'm a music appreciator. When they play perfectly together, they're in unison. And it sounds like one instrument. Beautiful. Right now, I'm super excited about the NFL being back and watching football. And I love when a, a team is playing in unison, playing together. And what will they say? They'll say, we're one team. This verse, Paul is saying this, let us be the kind of church that worships with one voice. In fact, Paul has all of these ones that he writes about, one voice, one spirit, one baptism. We all belong to the same Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us act in concert with one another, in unison with each other, aiming towards harmony. And what happens is when you experience that, you experience the glory of Christ. Have you ever experienced it? I've been gathering with a group of people, singing in this shared struggle, worshiping in unison, and experiencing the glory of Christ, realizing that what Christ has given to me, he's given to everybody around me. Paul's showing us a bigger picture of that glory. This final verse, verse six, it says this. It says, then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One voice, one spirit. And the third and final thought that I have is this, is accept each other. It says, therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. The way that the church is going to spread throughout this community is we become a group of people that learns how to accept. Now, at the very beginning, I said this, we live in a lot of tension. To accept someone doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything they're doing or everything that they're saying. In fact, we can disagree respectfully and still accept people and love people and care for people. One of the most beautiful things that has happened to me during this season was uh, my son was graduating this year. Graduated in May and June with um, so many other people that graduated this year in a very unique way. And uh, as we were getting ready for graduation, we kind of went through the same thing that everybody else went with. Are we going to have a normal graduation? Maybe as time got closer, we realized it would be in a car, a unique experience. And what happened was one of my neighbors who I'd never met saw the sign that was outside of our, our um, house that showed my son was graduating. And she came up to me and she said, hey, I see that your son's graduating. There's one other student in our neighborhood that's graduating. And we just think this must be one of the most tough times to graduate. So I got together with some of the neighborhood and we want to throw a car parade for your son and the other girl that's graduated in our neighborhood. And I was overwhelmed. I don't know them. I've never met them. And so we got ready on his graduation weekend day. They said it. And our whole neighborhood, about 45 different people, got in cars and they lined up at the end of our neighborhood and they drove by. And my family stood outside underneath an umbrella because it was raining. My son was wearing his graduation outfit and they started driving by and honking and waving at my son. And I looked over and my wife was just weeping. She was just weeping. And my son, he was like, okay, I'm here. I, I'm, I'm trying to do my best. And would you believe that they gave him lots of money. They gave him gifts. They gave him words of encouragement to a young man they've never met. Why? Because they realize that he's in a struggle. When someone sees your struggle and says, hey, I'm with you, what it does is it unifies. I just wonder if we're in a season where when we're feeling the tension, we need to go above the tension and say, hey, I see you're struggling. I want you to know I share in that struggle. I'm not sure what to do. I'm not sure what to say. I don't know how to handle it. What I know is this, is that God's given me his glory and I see the glory he's put in your heart and life. And I want us to share that and experience that. Today, wherever you're at, I want to pray for you. And maybe you're coming here today and you're dealing with some tension and you're struggling and you're just feeling like, I don't know if I can overcome it. Let this be a moment where Christ fills you with his glory and gives you the grace to be someone who unifies at your home, in your community, and in your church. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we take this moment and we pray right now. 
We pray for each person that's listening today or watching online. We ask, God, that you would be right there present with them. God, we pray, God, that you would take this struggle, this difficulty that they're feeling, and we lay it at your cross. And we ask, God, that you would bring peace to our soul. Jesus, for those that are dealing with just bad thoughts, argumentative spirit, seem to be fighting and defensive with every area. God, we just, we lay that defense down. We ask that we would humble ourselves just as you were humbled to the cross so that we might experience the glory you have for us. God, let us be a church that grows through the season. Let us be a community of people that spreads heaven everywhere we go and let us see the glory in other people around us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. The life you gave, your body was broken, your love poured out. You bled and you died for me there on the cross. You breathed your last as you crucified. You gave it all.
Thanks for being here today. Yeah, have a great week on the mission. Uh, uh, come here. Come here. Oh. oh, hey friends. I didn't realize you were in my garden. If you haven't, parents, go ahead and grab your kids now. We are about to tune into our kids' message. And I just want to say, good job on back to school. I know it's been a little bit different this season, so I just want to encourage you. You are doing awesome. The Bible. It's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how He created us and loves us so much that He made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. And now for an amazing story. Inspired by the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. For many years, God's people were ruled by kings who refused to listen to God. So God sent prophets to speak his words. One was a man named Elijah. I serve the Lord. Elijah did amazing things through God's power, like calling for rain after three years of drought and uh, bringing a dead boy back to life. But being a prophet was a lonely, difficult life. After the evil queen Jezebel threatened his life, Elijah fled to Mount Horeb. God, I've been committed to you, but the people have turned their backs on me. I am the only prophet left. God already had an answer to Elijah's pleas. A friend. Go back the way you came. Anoint Elisha from Abel Mehola as the next prophet after you. So Elijah tightened his belt and set out along the road. When he finally reached the town, he noticed several young men plowing with a dozen pair of oxen. And in the very last field, he noticed one of the young men struggling to keep his oxen in line. Get up there, Ham. Move along, Burger. God, is that Elisha? He's just a small town kid. What does he have? Does he have what it takes to be a prophet? But God had chosen Elisha, so Elijah tramped through the muddy field to greet the young man. Elisha. Elisha blinked in surprise when he saw the prophet. Whoa, Burger. Elijah marched right up to Elisha and threw his very own cloak over the young man's shoulders. It was a sign that God had chosen Elisha to be Elijah's assistant. Me? You're choosing me? Elijah turned and walked away. Elisha dropped the reins and ran after. Wait, just let me say goodbye to my family. Then I'll come with you. Go right ahead. I'm not making you do anything. Yes, sir. Right then and there, Elisha broke apart his plow and used the wooden pieces to start a fire. He cooked a meal and called all his family and friends over to share it with him. I'm leaving to travel with Elijah. Goodbye, everyone. Then Elisha set out on the road beside Elijah. I don't really know how to be a prophet, or, or even a prophet's assistant. That's okay, you'll learn. So over the years, Elisha followed Elijah everywhere as a close companion and good friend, and he watched and listened intently as Elijah spoke God's words to powerful kings and, and did incredible things. One day, Elisha and Elijah left the town of Gilgal on the way to Bethel, and they both knew that God was about to do something very breathtaking. God was going to take Elijah up to heaven. Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. Elisha wasn't about to leave his friend to go it alone. As sure as the Lord and you are alive, I won't leave you. At Bethel, the same thing happened. Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. As sure as the Lord and you are alive, I won't leave you. It happened once again in Jericho. Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan River. As sure as the Lord and you are alive, I won't leave you. You do realize you're repeating yourself. Together, Elisha and Elijah reached the banks of the Jordan River. The waters flowed dark and deep. Elijah removed his coat and rolled it up. And then he struck the river. Immediately, the waters parted to the right and left. Elisha and Elijah walked across the river on dry ground. They reached the opposite bank. Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken away? <sighs> Elisha didn't want to lose his friend and mentor, Elijah, but he'd learned many things in the last few years. Please, give me a double share of the spirit God has given you. Only the Lord can do that. But 
If you see me when I'm taken away, that means you will receive what you've asked for. Elisha nodded, and the two men walked on in silence. Suddenly, a wild wind whipped up, and a chariot and horses appeared, blazing with fire. Elijah. The flaming chariot flew down right between the two men. It caught up Elijah and carried him up to heaven, driven by a strong wind. Elijah, you are like a father to me. Elisha stared into the sky until the last breath of wind and the final hint of flame were gone. Then in great sorrow, he tore his own clothes. My best friend is gone. Glancing down at the ground, he saw Elijah's coat. Carefully, he picked it up. I wonder. Elisha hurried back to the bank of the Jordan River. Again, the water flowed hard and fast. On the opposite bank, a group of prophets from Jericho watched. Look, there's Elisha, but where's Elijah? Across the river, Elisha twisted up Elijah's coat. He called out in a loud voice. Where is the power of the Lord? Where is the power of the God of Elijah? Then Elisha struck the water just as Elijah had done. And just like what happened before, the waters parted to the right and left. The prophets from Jericho stared in amazement as Elisha crossed the river on dry land. The spirit God gave to Elijah has been given to Elisha. It was true. Elisha had been faithful to follow and learn from Elijah for many years, and now God's spirit was with Elisha just as it had been with his friend. Bye. Bye. See you next week.